Welcome to Strange New England. I'm your host, Tom Burby, revisiting the incident at Exeter. New Hampshire has always held a fascination for me, but it's not the mountains or the live free or die attitude, and it's not the New Hampshire Motor Speedway or even Strawberry Bank either. As a young man from far northern Maine, I took my share of trips out of the state at the rate of about two per year. Each time we drove into New Hampshire, especially as night was falling, and we passed the sign that read, Exeter, I kept my eyes on the skies. You see, in my young imagination, the Granite State's reputation as a UFO hotspot fired my imagination. When I was a kid, I read John G. Fuller's Incident at Exeter, and it forever altered my view of UFOs. This year, if you've a mind that turns to wondering about such things, there will be a celebration of sorts in the town of Exeter, New Hampshire. On September 5th and 6th, the town is hosting the Exeter UFO Festival, a fundraiser for the local Kiwanis Club and its charitable programs. This is a blend of campy fun and serious ufology studies. With a list of speakers from physicist Stanton Friedman to political commentator Richard Dolan, the visitors will receive more than their fair share of serious investigatory work. Meanwhile, kids can explore a UFO crash site in the park, along with extraterrestrial arts and crafts. A fun time to be had by all, no doubt, but the best part, might be after all of the talks and activities when the town quiets down and the night skies darken. And then all you need to do is possibly just look up to be entertained. Of course, those who visit the festival on a lark might find themselves fascinated by two of the most famous UFO stories ever investigated. The famous Hill abduction of 1961 is the more famous of the two cases. It gained attention in the media as the first widely publicized report of an alien abduction in our country. A best-selling book by John G. Fuller, The Interrupted Journey sold like hotcakes from the bookstore shelves. Even today, Betty and Barney Hill's notes, tapes, and other items, including the dress she wore during the abduction, have been placed in the University of New Hampshire's permanent collection. The state has even marked the site of the alleged abduction with an appropriate historical marker. For readers interested in the Hill abduction, there are plenty of online resources that detail their story. There's even a movie that stars James Earl Jones. It's definitely worth the research and reading. But in the end, we only have the words of the couple and Betty's dreams as a kind of remembrance of the events. Later, hypnosis seems to confirm the truth of the events, though hypnosis still must rely solely on subjective testimony. It's the other famous case that fascinates me. It concerns events that occurred in nearby Kensington in the early morning of September 3rd, 1965, and these are in the official police records at the Exeter Police Station. At around 2 o'clock in the morning... 18-year-old Norman Muscarello was hitchhiking to his parents' home along Highway 150. Having already enlisted in the U.S. Navy, he'd been spending time with his girlfriend at her parents' home in Amesbury, Massachusetts. There was little traffic on the road at that time of night, and he spent most of his time just walking. And that's when he noticed five red lights low in the sky flashing on and off. Later, he would claim that the craft was as big as a house, and according to his story, when the thing moved away from him and began hovering over a nearby farmhouse, Muscarello jumped out of the ditch he had been cowering in and ran to the house, pounding on the door as the lights got lower and closer. Of course, no one was home. He was alone, except for whatever or whoever was behind the mysterious lights. He ran back to the road, and thankfully a passing car stopped to pick him up. He asked to go to the police station in nearby Exeter. As Muscarello reported what he had just witnessed to the policeman in the station, Patrolman Eugene Bertrand must have had a perplexed look on his face. You see, hours before, while patrolling the roads, he had stopped to help a motorist parked on the Route 101 bypass. She was visibly shaken, and when the officer inquired why, 
She explained that she'd been followed by a huge glowing object in the sky for the past 12 miles all the way from Epping. It had red glowing lights and was as big as a house. At the time, Patrolman Bertrand simply wrote her off as a kook and remained with her long enough for her to resume her journey, about 15 minutes. It hardly seemed mentioning. It is, though, the testimony of Patrolman Bertrand that makes this particular UFO story worth considering. Here was a no-nonsense man of the law, a level-headed, professionally trained, and well-respected member of the law enforcement community who was willing to go back out to the farmhouse Muscarello mentioned to see if there was any evidence of otherworldly visitation or if this young man was possibly under some kind of influence. With Muscarello in the passenger seat, Bertrand drove them back to the site. As they sat in the car, nothing seemed out of place or amiss. But not content with simply investigating from the driver's seat, Bertrand told Muscarello to follow him and that they would have a look around. That's when things got weird. Though there were no people about, some horses in a nearby barn began kicking at their stalls and neighing. Local dogs began barking and howling. Something was causing them concern. That was when they saw an object rising from the edge of the trees at the end of the field. Officer Bertrand unholstered his pistol, withdrew it, fell on one knee, and took aim. Now, for whatever reason, he decided not to squeeze the trigger. Instead, he grabbed the teenager and ran back to the squad car. He immediately called the station, exclaiming, My God, I see the damn thing myself! He later described the object as a brilliant, roundish object without a sound. White light filled the area. As they waited for Officer David Hunt to arrive, the two witnesses watched the object, about 100 feet from them and about 100 feet off the ground, pulsate its light from the left to the right, swaying back and forth. Then the lights pulsated from the right to the left. Officer Hunt arrived and also witnessed the object and its strange behavior, adding another well-respected and trustworthy witness to the event. Soon enough, the object rose and flew away from them over the trees. When their chief read their reports that night, he decided to contact authorities at nearby Pease Air Force Base and report the sighting. Major David Griffin and Lieutenant Alan Brandt came to Exeter to interview the three men involved and asked all three of them not to report their sighting to the press. But it was too late for that. The Manchester Union leader had already spoken to the men and scooped the story. In his report, Major Griffin would write, quote, At this time, I have been unable to arrive at a probable cause of this sighting. The three observers seem to be stable, reliable persons, especially the two patrolmen. I viewed the area of the sighting and found nothing in the area that could be the probable cause. Pease Air Force Base had five B-47 aircraft flying in the area, but I do not believe that they had any connection with this sighting." Before it had a chance to be investigated by the official UFO investigatory team of Project Blue Book, the Pentagon issued a statement saying that the men had seen nothing more than stars and planets twinkling, owing to a temperature inversion. This would become one of the classic explanations for hundreds of alleged UFO encounters, in addition to swamp gas. An Air Force operation, Big Blast, began operations that night as well, and this might have added to the confusion, according to the entry for the incident in Project Blue Book. The three men involved were angry at the Air Force's dismissal of their testimony. In the press, and personally, these two officers, and now U.S. serviceman Muscarello, involved had nothing good to say about the Air Force's conclusions, and they made no bones about it. In 1966, the Air Force finally relented in a reply to the letters. Lieutenant John Spaulding from the office of the Secretary of the Air Force wrote to the men, quote, Based on additional information submitted to our UFO investigation office, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Ohio, we have been unable to identify the object you observed on September 3, 1965, unquote. The story made its way into the mainstream media. First, it was printed in the Saturday Review, then for Look Magazine, and then for Reader's Digest. John G. Fuller would later write an account of the events entitled Incident at Exeter, and it would not only become a New York Times bestseller, but would remain one of the top-selling books on the subject of UFOs for decades. 
No one knows for certain what was witnessed by Officers Bertrand Hunt and Mr. Muscarello that night. The incident at Exeter is only one of thousands of UFO sightings in New England in the early 1960s and remains one of the most famous accounts because of the veracity of the men involved. You've been listening to Strange New England. <laughs>